Since the promising but preemie reveal trailer featuring a suspiciously affluent protagonist jet-setting betwixt dueling Richie Rich mansions before exchanging awkwardly rehearsed glances with Kid and Play in a fucking stoner van before ear-fucking frost giants in Skyrim on an airplane, my Nintendo Switch boner's been firmly affixed in the upright and locked position. But when the dust had cleared, functionality aside, I found remarkably few burning questions had been provided with a coherent answer. Price point, launch date, specs, what brand of lube to lather our leathery assholes with prior to fucking launch, and then, this past week, the velvet meat curtains parted, and out popped an N-bomb. Users will be able to try out Nintendo Switch online services for free during a trial period after launch. Then, it will become a paid service beginning in the fall of 2017. Say what you will about the tone-deaf twattery that's characterized the Nintendo strategy of the past six years or so, one thing you can't fault them for is their absolute mastery of the art of the press conference. While Microsoft and Sony lob multi-platitudes at our fucking skulls and find themselves showered in fanboy ejaculate irrespective of the actual quality of the announcements, after some nauseating efforts in the mid to late 2000s or so... <laughs> Nintendo hoisted themselves up by their Goomba boots and proceeded to painstakingly teabag every organic being in a nine-block radius, all without the benefit of a proper stage production at the event in question. The Nintendo Switch reveal event, almost in spite of the machine featured at it, was no fucking exception in this regard. You know Nintendo's fixing to push the industry shit in when they fucking open the show with the first open-world Mario title in over a decade. And then then, a gentleman whose name I forget and will therefore be referred to hereafter as Harry Potter McMom Jeans brought the heavy lumber, a reasonable $300 price point, and a move that catapulted my eyebrows to the troposphere, a launch date just over a motherfucking month in the future. That's right, despite only being formally announced in late October, on March 3rd, you can USB fuck this saucy enchantress to your diseased heart's content. My first thought, after recovering from the fatal mustache poisoning upon realizing the IGN pre-stream was hosted by the Scorpion, Tawny fucking Toliners! <laughs> Was hipster haircuts aside, the Nintendo Switch feels like a roll of the dice all around. After the Wii went from dominating the entertainment center of every frumpy housewife in the Oprah book club to the bell of the bargain bin, followed shortly thereafter by a Wii U console that sold a fuck of a lot of first party software and nothing the fuck else, it was half past time for a hard reset. And at first glance, that's precisely what they did. So, Nintendo Switch comes with two controllers right from the start. And when you play with these Joy-Con, they fit in the palm of your hand, just right, like this. And they feel very natural. Natural where, Haji, the muscular dystrophy ward? And whose palm is that supposed to fit in, Frodo's? Of all the things for the Japanese to make smaller and more efficient, the controller? I understand broad appeal is the watchword for the big end, but who the fuck is that glorified goddamn sunglasses case aimed at? The ever-elusive Smurf market? Fisher Price presents the Nintendo Switch for the Marco Rubio in all of us. You can hand a Joy-Con to the person next to you in many two-player games. We call this sharing the joy. Of what? Carpal tunnel syndrome? If you're gonna charge me $80 for a controller, it better operate the vault door to Fort Knox, you fuck. Look, maybe I'm just a rube, but I have to say, for all its applicability and economy, both of which I concede are a huge plus for the console, when you need to devote one quarter of your two-hour presentation to explaining the mere act of playing a game, you're teetering precariously close to a clusterfuck, my friend. I mean, look at previous offerings. Nintendo Entertainment System, slide in, close, flap, commence game. Super Nintendo, plug in, flip, switch, brandish new streamlined controller, commence gaming. Nintendo 64, slide in, flip, switch, spend 50 minutes deciding which end of the fucking controller to hold, commence gaming. GameCube, open tray, insert disc, thrill to the melodious trilling of schizophrene xylophone music, commence gaming. Wii, slide in, switch on, brandish new chaku, commence gaming. Bill Satoru Iwata's cremated corpse for the full value of your soon-to-be-demolished TV set. Wii U! 
<laughs> Lie prostrate in soul-crushing loneliness at the knowledge you're one of the five human beings on Terra who owns a fucking Wii U. But this fucking thing? It ain't like I need a tutor to play Mario Kart, motherfucker, but neither should I need a refresher course to drop a deuce to some Donkey Kong. Detachable accessories, wrist straps, control harnesses. But the Lord of the Dance was unquestionably the software portion of the evening. Mario Odyssey, Splatoon 2, Shin Megami Tensei... To trillion, I can't believe it's not we play. And then Suda51 showed up to remind us all what a full body cringe feels like. Next, let's switch to this person. Yeah! Hey. Oh, that didn't go very well. Well, that went over like a Slayer song on Dancing with the Stars. Hey, Cock Goblin, what's the 51 stand for? The number of times I want to punch you in the balls or the number of horse tranquilizers they spiked your translator's drink with? Today, I'd like to start. Um, I've, I've been invited to come to this event, and I'd like to talk about uh, one of the games that I worked on. Great googly moogly! Equivocate any harder and the square heads will give you a fucking peace prize there, Kenji. Xenoblade Chronicles 2 then splayed its Nihongo Philix seed all over the screen, representing the first numbered entry since 2010, and the first game in the series to feature the same fucking antagonist as Final Fantasy X. That said, it was still a welcome addition. There is, and always will be, a place for Moe humping Nihongo files in gaming. <laughs> a body bag. But the game that stole the show, and at least 17 more hereafter, was unquestionably The Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild. The first full-blown sandbox in series history, a return to the cell-shaded supremacy of yore, with a wider weeping to gameplay disparity than Darkseid Phil playing Bloodborne, or checking his own viewership figures, and while it does indeed look exceptional, and I've been sold on the title almost since the first gameplay demo, it was at this point that one unanswered question became unerringly conspicuous by its omission. The hardware under the hood. Look, I'm no graphics geek. I'll giddily absorb Jaggies beyond count if it means an additional gameplay feature or 20. But between the negligible visual distinction between Breath of the Wild on Switch and previous versions I've seen running on Wii U, coupled with a detachable touchscreen I refuse to believe for a microsecond was a frugal affair to manufacture, along with a meager $300 price tag, it seems all but a foregone conclusion the Nintendo Switch will represent a mild hardware upgrade if it in fact represents any upgrade at all. That bears mentioning precisely because two of the Wii U's most glaring fallibilities were its awkward launch window timing in 2012, causing it to perpetually feel like a relic from the previous generation rather than a vanguard of the forthcoming one, and its anemic hardware in general. After an initial typhoon of titles, third parties eventually threw up their hands in unison and abandoned the Wii U entirely, largely because it was impossible to port many of the more demanding PS4 and Xbox One titles of this generation to the little console that could. And so, it languished, and porting five-year-old experiences like Skyrim to the Switch does precisely dick to ameliorate this perception. Now, this comes with a caveat. It's possible the price is part of the aforementioned roll of the dice gamble it's clear the Switch represents to begin with, and Nintendo is content to take a loss on each console unit to build the install base moving forward. I, for one, dig the idea of a springtime release. You simultaneously reduce competition and steal every major gaming headline for the next seven months until the competition finally drop their increasingly disappointing holiday offerings in October and November. But... Then there's the elephant in the room, sadly one I still feel is somewhat unaddressed after this conference. Perhaps the single largest contributor to the wipeout of the Wii U was the fact that the fucker was neither fish nor fowl. In an age where casual gaming has largely migrated to smartphones the size of a goddamn graham cracker, how inoperable would your brain tumor have to be to purchase a larger, clunkier, more expensive variant of it with half the battery life and twice the cost for the privilege of playing while you piss? And festooned with seven-year-old ports of 360 and PS3 titles with hardware roughly equivalent to the consoles in question, you can French kiss that hardcore audience goodbye to boot. And the Switch, nifty detachable dildos and all, kinda still occupies the self-same digital DMZ where the Wii U took a howitzer round of the head. Could these concerns prove immaterial? Absolutely. Stranger fucking things have happened. I say this is someone who owns the dust cake paperweight in question, so I feel I have a license to say the PS4 is among the most underwhelming bare-bones bullshit I've ever owned in life. But good luck getting it to stop printing money in the near future. In the age of social media, properly harnessed hype can stop a hurricane, which as much as anything explains why the PS4 fucking blows. I'm Razor Fist. God, fucking speed. <laughs>